feel like uh, I feel like I'm uh, some kind of a wedding with all these things here. So uh, let's proceed. These are the lessons learned in getting uh, our ideal customers and uh, keeping them. But before diving into this, let me tell you a bit of a story about this guy, Ignaz Semmelweis. He's a physician. He used to be a physician in the 19th century, and he had a problem. The mortality rate among the women in his maternity, in where he was practicing, uh, were dying one out of ten after him and his doctors were operating there. But in a second uh, section on the same maternity ward, the mortality rate was one out of 50. So that was kind of awkward for him because he was actually running the show in that hospital. And uh, during a fourth month leave to another hospital, something really interesting happened and really intriguing. The mortality rate in the section where he was uh, operating dr dr drastically has fallen. And some of us started to investigate what that ha why that happened. And he discovered that the doctors that were operating there were also doing research on cadavers. And based on that finding, he realized that there might be some strange particles that are coming through patients' hands and they are being transported over there. And thanks to this discovery, we are now having the theory of germs. So he discovered that particles from cadavers and other diseased patients are being transmitted to, to healthy patients, right? Through the hands of the physicians. So as a result, he made this policy, this new policy. So he required that all the doctors should wash their hands before doing any kind of intervention to the mothers. So the death rate immediately plummeted to one out of 100. And that's the problem. So as a founder, the first lesson you should be, let's say, a knowledge is that you are always the problem. You are the responsible for anything that happens in your company. So if you are here to build a product, if you are here to start a company, if you want to do anything with your, this new system, this new baby that you are about to born, you're going to be the problem for all the things that will happen. So you're going to be in charge to solve these problems and you need to go to the mirror every time there's a problem in your company because otherwise you're missing out the connection between what's going on in the company and who's in charge to craft this company. And I've actually learned that there's no one to blame. Even though I'm coming from the same country as most of you are coming in Romania, you're always looking for someone to blame. Right? So if something happens, we are not solution-oriented. We are blame-oriented. So who's in charge? Who made this happen? Why did this happen? Not, not let's solve this. Why that happen and let's solve this in the future. And this is the first lesson and I, I, I really hope that we're aware about the fact that we need to take responsibility here because otherwise we're going to be always pointing fingers towards the reasons why. So my name is Valentin. I'm a, I've made a lot of terrible mistakes. And uh, my only merit is that I continue to do this. So I haven't stopped. That's the only merit. Because if you don't do your mistakes, if you don't fall in the trap of, uh, let's say, seeing things and having bad expectations towards how reality actually is, you're not going to find out how reality actually is. And we are in complete dark over here. So we are, we as founders, we as builders, we are in space. And wherever we are going to look, we, we can't have the certainty that this is going to happen. Unless we want to build something like a gogosheria, right? Where everything is clear. So in the last six years, we managed to help a lot of, com of big companies, such as, I don't know, Samsung or Orange or Whirlpool or whatever. You see them over here. But for lesson two, I would like your help because I can't do this myself. So let's do a quick test. Can you help me with that? 
Can you help me with that? Come on, guys. I'm here. I'm alone. And you are there. You're all of you against me. So do you want to help me? Perfect. So let's count the number of red squares that we are seeing over here. Yeah? So we have 20 seconds. Three, two, one, go. Eight seconds. Five seconds. Two seconds. Okay. So how many were orange? Anybody? Anybody here? Nobody? Nobody counted the orange squares? Nobody counted the orange squares. Exactly. That's what's happening. So I'm going to get back to this test. We had this problem at building OmniConvert. We've started in 2013, and we've got this strange bias in our heads. So if we've got problems with not converting trials into customers, we thought, OK, let's develop new features. If we've got problems with the growth rate, what was the solution to that? Let's develop new features. If the customer acquisition cost was too high, guess what? We've got back to the drawing board, and we started to code, and then new features were added. And if the customers were churning and not sticking around, what have we done? We've started to build new features. So we ended up having a huge, huge code base and a lot of spaghetti code from the past and so on. So the alternative could be if you're not converting enough trials into customers, you should identify your ideal customer profile. If you don't know where you are going in your company, maybe you should do a deep diving into your funnel and to find out what's going on with all these micro conversions. If the time to close is too high, maybe you should do the same to test and find out new channels. So, and if the customers are churning, maybe it's, it's time to find out what their real needs are and what, which are their jobs to be done, like Bob Moesta stated beautifully earlier, and what would make them successful with your product. And the problem is that if all we have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So what we've done earlier was to look over the things that we were trained We've got the right, we've got all these things like let's look over the red squares. And that was our frame because we are surrounded by a lot of information over here. And if we don't change our mentality from building products and features to solving needs and problems and listening to the customer's needs, we're gonna end up having a huge product with no use. So the second lesson for us was that persistence can be a trap if you insist in the wrong direction. So you should know your ideal customer profile inside out before building and before writing any line of code. Ask yourself this question. Do I know who's the ideal customer profile for my company? And more about this a bit further. So another problem. Back in 2016, we've got 1 million euro in funding. And we've said to ourselves, OK, let's hire more sales guys. Let's make this happen. We're going to do it, right? So in July in 20, 2016, I've observed that we've got this uh, ping pong contest called Ping Poniada. And the ones which were winning were the sales guys, because they, we've got something like six account executives and eight calls per day. That makes one point a bit per AE per day. That means they were working 30 minutes out of eight hours of work, according to the, I don't know, con their contract, their agreement. So we've realized this is wrong. But it took us more months to realize how wrong it is, so that in 2016, in November, when we were looking at the uh, expenses, which is the blue line, and the revenue, which was the red line, we've actually realized that not going to be sustainable in the future. So mainly, the third problem is that more sales reps doesn't necessarily mean more sales. So you should scale only after you nail something which is called channel market fit. Do you know which, how many of you know about channel market fit? Perfect, we have one here. So that was 
a very, very hard lesson for us and for the culture as well. Because the problem wasn't only that we were bleeding money. The problem was that the ones which were previously working and the, the guys which were actually started this company with, together with me were working their asses while the new guys coming from, I don't know, these kind of corporate companies, I don't know, IBM, Oracle, you name it, they were sitting there and they were playing ping pong because they were the, the lucky ones, right? And imagine this happening in a company with uh, 60 employees and imagine all the mess that happened and what saved me over there and what saved us over there was the fact that we were doing all these, let's say, meetings. Every two weeks we were meeting together with all the company. And I do remember the moment when I had to stay there in November and, and to, to tell everyone that we have 16 people that we're not gonna be in the, the company anymore with us. And all these one-on-ones were really, really, really making me suffer. But Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn, right? So another problem that we discovered was the churn. Churn was our problem. Back in 2016, our churn was 18.9%. That means 18.9% of all our customers were disappearing every month. So our growth rate in order to sustain that should have been at least 19% just to stay flat. And we've started to look over the data, right? Because uh, the truth is over there in the data, if you know where to look at. So we've started to do customer segmentation first by location, and we've uh, analyzed the share of revenue and share of websites which are using our technology, which is an A-B testing and personalization platform, and the share of support tickets. And guess what? We realized where were most of the tickets and where was most of the hurdle, and we realized where was most of the revenue. But we haven't stopped by location. We've gone further analyze the segmentation by the company type, agencies, e-commerce, lead generation, software as a service, and other type of websites. How much they are contributing to the revenue, how many of them there were, and what was the mess that they produced in our support uh, department. Then we segment them by the number of employees, and we realize that 77% of the revenue is coming from companies which are having more than 200 employees, but they are only 21% of all our customers, and they are using only 18% of our support capacity. And that was a new discovery. Then we've segmented them based on the subscription period, and we realized that the monthly plans, however, they, they were 80% of, uh, they were using 80% of our capacity, but they were 37% of our revenue. And then we realized that we should look at the, the level of assistance. And we've, say, we've seen that the assisted companies were uh, having a, a lifetime value which was four times bigger than the ones which were self-served. And eventually, we've also looked at the acquisition channel. And we haven't realized anything but the fact that the inbound channel is producing the customers with the higher li highest lifetime value. And last but not the least, it was the features. So what kind of features they were using uh, the most of the customers and what was the, the share of revenue based on that? So that was the aha moment for us because we realized that one ideal customer profile generates as much as 76 average customers for us. So it's not smart or fair to treat everyone the same because that's the definition of communism, right? So our ideal customer profile from then, then onwards were, was from US and Europe, it should be assisted, it has more than 200 employees, it's a digital player, has a budget for that and pays annual. And that changed completely not only the way we are charging and acquiring customers, but the whole organizational structure should be made around your ideal customer profile. So that meant a dramatic move in, in the way we were positioning. So three years after, our churn is 2.7%. So knowledge helps retention. Moving forward, back in 2013, our company was called Marketizator. But the native English speaking were saying Marketizator. And it was kind of funny, right? Because we couldn't market the, the product to the US market if they were uh, uh, spelling it uh, incorrectly. So at that moment, we thought that we are a software as a service and we thought that the success meant platform adoption, number of users and revenue growth. In 2016, when we've changed a bit 
we still made uh, our assumption that we are a software as a service and success meant ideal customer profile and customer revenue and year over year growth. Moving forward to this year, we realized that we are not doing software as a service. We are doing service as a software, like HubSpot is doing or like Optimizely is doing. There are a lot of companies which are having complex products like we have, and they simply don't have the talent to use this kind of technology. So we need to assist the customers because it's, if our unique value proposition is same traffic, more conversions, we are lying. We should mean same traffic, more conversions, if you have an expert in-house that knows to do data-driven insights and UX and so on. So that's why we need to assist them and we need to keep our promise. And at this moment, we have the OmniConvert platform, the OmniConvert services, and we also have, have incubated in the last two years two new products. One is a machine learning conversion rate optimization platform, and another one is a customer intelligence platform. So at this moment, the success means employee happiness first, then attracting talent then ideal customer profile satisfaction because that's the definition from my perspective right now of success if you are a company, right? You need to deliver on your promise and you need to know what kind of pains are you really re relieving. And last but not the least, it's enjoying the ride together because it's a process and we are now in the middle of that process. We're not at the end, we're not at the beginning. We are a six years old company and, and we've past the childhood when we were playing ping pong and then we've passed the teenage moment and now we are actually much more mature and we know where we're going. Fourth is that I've messed around with the slides, but still we, we can go further. So the next lesson is towards the people. You have here a lot of people, right? We've, we've been broadcasting our message to the Romanian market and we've been so stubborn that we, we, we stayed here in Romania to hire people. And we've qualified a lot of people, right? So there were uh, a lot of uh, guys and girls which are not st staying in Romania anymore. We've qualified them from, for London or for Barcelona or for Dublin and they've went away and they, they've been somehow highly trained to be there on those markets because at OmniConvert, you really need to deliver if you are one of our colleagues. And the last but not the least is the fact that if you don't genuinely care about your team, you're missing out the whole game. And my purpose, besides building companies, which is a step in my life plan, because business plan should be a part of your life plan. And on my path, I just want to activate the highest potential in people, even though they will fly away and they will build other companies or they will move out or they will fly to different uh, territories. That's my mission. And uh, if I'm gonna fulfill my, my, my mission, then I'm not gonna look back when I'll be 85 years old thinking that what have I done with my life? Because it's not about the revenue that you're getting or about the zeros. I've seen the zeros and what makes me happy and what's my objective is towards having quality relationships. It's ab about crafting things which are actually working. It's not about the zeros. Even though you can fall in this trap and I've, I've fallen in that trap for a lot of times because that's my fourth company already, it's not about the zeros. Because if you will deliver the value to your colleagues, to your customers, to your uh, investors, then the money will follow you. They will be like the shadow, so you can't get away. They will follow you no matter where you're going because value should be the first one and money will be the after. This is an, uh, let's say, effect of your, uh, of your actions. So that was it. If you have uh, any kind of uh, questions, I have a lot of time for that because I've, uh, that was my intention. So uh, we're gonna have uh, Andre, I think, 10 minutes and uh, 30 seconds for, uh, for your questions. I, I would love to, to help you out because I know here in Romania, we haven't got this experience in building companies, tech companies, uh, companies which are addressing the international markets. And I would really like to, to pay back because I've got this kind of uh, uh, knowledge also by asking questions from a lot of uh, tenured entrepreneurs like Florin Talpes from Bitdefender or Julian from Emag. Uh, a lot of people that supported me 
allowed me to actually fix a bit my cognitive biases. So if you have questions, I'm here. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation and for your openness in doing, uh, in helping out and reaching out to people. A big round of applause before we start the questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, you said you're a serial entrepreneur. If you were to start all over again, what would you do differently? What would I do differently? I would do the math better, I think. So How so? Yeah, I, I would, uh, I would, I would spend more time in planning and less time in uh, acting. So I wouldn't jump to action so so quickly because we maybe it's a it's a problem with with us in Romania as a culture because most of the time we are not spending into planning, right? In the Nordics, for instance, they are they are uh, spending around 60% of the total period of acting towards the project on planning, and we are I think we are spending 5% or so. So we are very action oriented maybe like the turks or here in the balkans but i would plan ahead much more better and i would uh, be much more patient because it's uh, surprisingly fulfilling to 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 see how things are evolving if you if you don't justify your uh, value with the results that you're getting from the external world and this is uh, something that messed around with my with my mind for uh, for for months so i've been in this uh, Valea Plingeri in Romania, right? I've been in this, in this gap when I, when I was thinking, where am I going? I have the kids to, to spend time with them. I have a wife which I, which I love and I'm working 14 hours and I'm doing this, I must demonstrate, I must do it. While this was a, a, a moment when I was actually digging my own, my own grave. And uh, in order to keep on getting out of the grave, you, you just need to, to, to stop digging. That's the, that's the thing. Did you experience at any moment burnout? Well, I've, uh, I haven't got time for that. <laughs> so maybe I haven't realized, but I have months in a row when I was so uh, demanded that I thought that I'm living in a washing machine, you know? <laughs> so no time for burnout. Okay. Yeah, just ignore it, right? No time for it. It doesn't exist. Just <laughs> ignore it. Look the other way. Um, how would you go about attracting the right people to shape the culture that you want in your business? Uh, can you please repeat the question? Yes, sure. So how would you go about attracting the right people to shape the culture that you want? Yeah, you need to broadcast. So I think the, the, the days of e-jobs and best jobs and even LinkedIn talent solutions are, are over and will be over. If you want to build a company, you need to, let's say, attract people like you are attracting talents, uh, like you are attracting uh, customers. You need to broadcast and you need to position yourself and you need to, to, to have a voice in the whole market because on one way you have a lot of talented people which are wasting their lives like zombies in the corporate cages without having a, a proper culture. Not that all the corporate uh, mediums are like that, but I've seen that happening. And on the other hand, you have people which are good enough and talented enough, but they are fleeing out from the country. So here in Romania, you need, we need to broadcast and we need to, to have a voice so that we can keep, in, keep here the talent, so that we can team up and so that we can, let's say, go over the, the, the fact that only 3% of the population actually trusts their neighbors. We don't trust each other. And that's a fact according to, uh, I don't know, the Romanian peop, uh, nation uh, psychology. But we need to demonstrate that it's not like this. So we here, we are the generation that could either change what's going on with our country, either simply go and forget that we are even a nation and we have a, a language and we have some ancestors to, let's say, demonstrate that we deserve to be a team. So it's either we're going to be alive and broadcast and connect to each other and build things so that Bucharest is on the map, either will simply disappear. And I don't believe that's an option. Certainly not. And if talking about options, what is your ideal employee profile and how would you discover and nurture it in your team? Well, I, I've wasted a lot of opportunities to keep a lot of talented people in, uh, in the company. And uh, that was because I was so stubborn to uh, help them out too much. I think what really matters, you need to let the, the people affirm that they are good. And you need to give them autonomy. 
You need to give them the right to fail. You need to give them the energy like you are giving to a child, right? You can go on on the bike. You just need to assist them not to ride the bike instead of him. And I've done this mistake a lot of times. And uh, I was just thinking uh, later, uh, a few days before, what would it happen with this company if I wouldn't be, if we have only the talented people that in the last six years were here? But you can't do this. So in order, in order to, uh, let's say, help talent to, to, to thrive in, uh, in the company, you just need to step aside. So your role as a founder should be only to craft the context and the system and to, to let people do the stuff, not to do the stuff yourself. And I think that's a problem with the Romanian uh, culture somehow. And uh, I want to unscrew this from my mind. And that's why I'm uh, letting people do their mistakes. And when doing so, when stepping aside, creating the framework, how do you still make them feel, maybe the first employees of the startup, feel like it's their own company as well? I think that's, that's, a, that's not a matter of uh, only uh, equity and stock options and whatever, because this is an external fact. Uh, you do this by, uh, by letting them craft the vision together, together with you, by letting them tell what you should do by staying with them in these kind of sessions where you are not acting, but you are brainstorming, where you are just uh, asking how they feel about your own decisions. And uh, I think the best skill that you should have in order to do this is to listen more than you talk, because the, the demand is to, to, to speak more than you are listening when you're a founder, because you're action-oriented and you want to do this. But I've been dumb so many times and uh, I, have my, I have a lot of talented people which are way smarter than me on their roles. Mm -hmm. And from a different register of, uh, of your talk, let's see if, if it was the case. When did you realize or saw the signs that the project or initiative that you started was not worth the effort and moved over? I realized that by, by looking at the, uh, the, the market and uh, when we've seen that the, the late majority was starting and we were just uh, the eight company from out of uh, 20, and we've got only a market share of 0.8%, we realized that we don't have the funding. I don't know, Optimizely had 180 million euro in funding and we've got only one. They were in Silicon Valley, we were in Romania, and we got a lot of uh, justification not to, to go further in, in, in that space. So that's why we, we needed to pivot towards, uh, towards other things. So I think that if you look at the penetration rate, if you look at what, what kind of KPIs can you grab from the market, you will know where you are. And if you ask the customers, as well, you, they are not going to tell you you are bad and I will choose the other ones, but they will give you glimpses over why they will not choose you. And our own problem is the go-to-market because we've wasted three years crafting the best product before starting to do go-to-market strategy. And I think that's a common, let's say, bad habit here, right? And speaking of which, link, this links to another question. How much time should you invest uh, and continue to build until you realize that you should give up when building a startup? Uh, when should you stop? When should you stop? How much time should you invest before deciding this is not going anywhere? Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with who you are. And uh, for me, I have this long-term perspective over my life. So I have a plan which is on 20 years and I have only, I have 14 years left from that plan since I've started. And uh, I don't know, exactly how I'm going to craft the product, but I know what's the mission. And my mission is to support companies to grow through a data-driven approach. And that means building the technology and, and uh, the expertise so that I can help do that. And on the other hand, I have my internal mission in Romania to show that this is possible because that's my mission, right? And that means even though I'm not crafting the, the exact product and I'm not uh, uh, falling in the trap of uh, doing an exit and getting some millions and fly away, that means I should stick around and I should craft further. So it's not about giving up and starting all over again. My method is to, to simply reposition yourself because there are a lot of opportunities in markets which are already covered. You just need to look at the non-customers that you previously had. And you think that um, a business should be more product driven or customer driven only? 
Well, this is a question regarding uh, who's buying. If the product is buying, you should be product driven. If the customer is buying, you should be customer driven. But in order to be customer driven, you should take a look at the product that you are building. So it's a kind of a chicken and the egg problem. <laughs> You seem to care about a lot about honesty and authenticity while also building a product which is mainly used to help companies drive consumerism. Uh, what's your take on this? How do you balance the two? Consumerism drives the economy further. So let's say we are now in this uh, situation we are, where we are consuming more than we actually need. But let's, uh, let's pretend that the whole humanity is a kid which is uh, smoking and I'm the father. If I'm going to go there and I'm going to beat out and I'm going to, uh, let's say, uh, keep my kid from uh, smoking, is he going to smoke or not? He's going to continue smoking, right? Because the humanity has these phases where we finally will realize that consumerism is not good. And I'm, I've stopped and a lot of other people are stopping from overspending on clothes and, and overspending on a lot of other stuff. But we need, as a humanity, we need to surpass that moment so that we become aware that life is about transforming yourself, not owning more products. But we need to pass over this bad habit and dependence. And in order to do that, for me, it's a vehicle to, to be able to invest in education and in other things that I'm, uh, I believe in. And for me, that is, that's the, the, the vehicle with whom I'm investing in that. Being able to make all these investments, you have to have a good look at your numbers and your metrics. What tools do you use to uh, monetize your business metrics? Yeah, so we, we use internal, uh, internal crafted tools. Besides uh, analyzing traffic and data, we are, uh, we are looking at, uh, at the data we are grabbing through uh, satisfaction. We are using Intercom. We are using uh, HubSpot. We are using all the tools that you can imagine, but uh, Google Drive is still very, very good because we, we have uh, uh, two businesses under the same cockpit. Um, I have a technical question here, uh, and probably we'll have time for this one and probably just one other. Uh, regarding optimizing conversion, what are the three most important pillars that startups need to get right from the start and which three should not get initial attention? In your opinion, of course. Yeah, you should do, uh, let's say, you should ask questions first. So you should do a lot of uh, user interviews and you should find out first if there's a need for what you are trying to build. Because we are having this framework of engineering and we want to craft products and features, but nobody would buy this thing, right, if it's not useful. So the first thing in order to Im improve conversions would be simply to take a look at what customers need. And for that, you need to do user interviews. Then you need to attract I don't know, traffic or users and find out through their own wording what they found useful at your product and what they really need so that you can craft your unique value proposition so, so that it matches the expectations of, your, of the customers. And these are really easy things to do when you don't have enough traffic. If you have enough traffic, of course, you could do A-B testing and you could do this kind of uh, interactive content, but that's in the future. So as a startup, ask the right questions and craft the messaging and the unique value proposition to match the expectations and the needs of the customers. That sounds great. Uh, we have still questions coming in. However, we don't have the time for them. So one of the questions is, how can people reach out to you for advice or for other information? I'm on LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn fan, so I'll be there for, for you. So if you want to have any kind of uh, help from me, I'm there. Great. In the app, maybe, as well? Do you have an app, yeah, a profile in the app? Yeah, I have the, the app, app installed as well. Yeah, you can Perfect. reach me out there you're, as well. You're the great example, right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank Perfect. you very much for Thank your you, time Andrew. and for the Q&A session. Big round Thank of applause. You.